for solving behavior issues with horses. And when I solve behavior issues in horses, I always go through a process. And the process is going to be coming back to layers, listening to the horse, and finding the root cause of the behavior issue. If you can't find the, the root cause of the behavior issue, then solving the behavior issues would become very difficult because we don't know why the horse is bucking or rearing or running off or bolting, uh, what not. When we can find the root cause of the behavior issue, then solving the behavior issue becomes very, very, very simple. And when it comes to appealing back the layers and listening to the horse, actions speak louder than words. And that's how the horses are going to talk to us, is they're going to show us different actions that they're doing, either on the ground, uh, on a lunge line, in a round pin, whatnot. They're going to show us different actions, and that's the horses talking to us, and that's how we're going to be coming back to the layers, finding out why the horse is bucking, why the horse is rearing, or what's going on with the horse. And one of the leading causes of uh, behavior issues is pain-related issues. So if you think your horse is in pain or discomfort, always call a vet, um, always uh, call a chiropractor and have them treat your horse for discomfort if they're in pain or, or just really uncomfortable and you want to get them out of pain, so then you go into working on the behavior issue. All right, so if you don't know what the behavior or why the horse is uh, displaying a certain behavior, if you can't find the root cause, it'd be kind of like the, you know, the mechanic changing out parts in your car and he never finds out why your car is running bad, he starts changing out parts. It's going to take him a long time, it's going to get really, really, really expensive. However, if your mechanic does a diagnostic on your car, then he's going to know where to start looking for the, uh, why your car isn't running well and it will be very, very, very easy for him to change. And like I just said, it will be very, very, very simple for us to solve behavior issues in horses once we find the root cause of the problem. Another root cause of behavior issues, and we see this pretty much all the time, and we, uh, you know, we see it all the time, we see it at different facilities, we see different people doing it, and ground pinning is some of the best horse training you can actually do with your horse, and at the same time it could be the worst thing you ever do with your horse. Now when we're in a round pin with our horse, that round pin is a classroom. We're the teacher, this is the student, and everything we do with the horse, from the moment we step into their paddock, their stall, uh, pasture that they're staying in, it becomes learning time, all right? The classroom starts, and it becomes learning time. The play time is over with. So when people have their horses in a round pen, some of them will let the horses race around them, they'll let them buck, they'll let them do whatever they want in the round pen. Well, that round pen's supposed to be a classroom. And if we're letting the horse run around us and buck and rear and whatnot, race around us, then that's what we're teaching our horse. We're always teaching our horses something. We're teaching them something we want them to do, or we're teaching them something we don't want them to do. And the exercises in the round pen are controlled exercises. And when the horse is going around the round pen, bucking and running and just wild, then we're teaching the horse that behavior is okay, and that behavior isn't okay, all right? Then we go to get under saddle, and our horses are acting the same way under saddle. They start bucking, they want to race off, and it's because we just got done teaching them that behavior is okay in the round pen when we're in there with them. So always remember, the second you step into a paddock, stall, pasture with your horse, you're in the round pen with your horse, your horse is on the end of a lunge line, that is the classroom, that is learning time. And uh, we don't want to start teaching our horses things we don't want them to do. So that's always really important to remember. Now, when I do get new horses in training and uh, they have behavior issues, let's say they have a bucking issue or they're head shy or uh, something else is going on, they're rearing or whatnot, then it's my job to start peeling back the layers. And when I start peeling back the layers, I'm always looking at the horse. I want to see if the horse is in pain or not. So I'll go over everything I need to see if the horse is in pain. Um, you know, you can look at their back when you're lunging them. You can see if they're bobbing their heads up, which would be a uh, lame this in the hind end, or if they're bobbing their heads down, which would be a lame this in the front. You can see if they're in pain on one side or the other. For example, I was watching a, a girl the other day ride her horse in an arena, and she was going to the right with her horse. And the, the horse was into the bit, but the horse was very, very, very hollow in its back. And the horse was like riding a two-by-four going to the right. Well, if the horse is bending to the right, 
right? That means they're stretching the left side of their body if they're going to the right. They're bending to the right, they're stretching the left side of their body. And this horse looked like it was riding a two by four. It just was so bad going to the right. Well, that tells me the problem is on the left side of the horse where the horse is actually stretching and the horse isn't able to stretch on the left side. That's why I was uh, riding like a two by four. Now it could have been for a lot of different reasons. Um, the saddle didn't fit, the horse was in pain, the horse hurt, or it could have been for a number of other different reasons. But that's what we're talking about when we start peeling back the layers. And even though that horse is not in training with me, I was in there at the same time riding another horse and noticed it. And um, when you start peeling back the layers, you start noticing other things with other people's horses also. All right, so at a standstill, when I'm peeling back the layers, I'm always going to watch the horse's nose. I want to see if they're breathing normally or if they're breathing heavily. Uh, that's going to tell me a lot of different things. Um, when I start uh, peeling back the layers, I'm always watching the horse's mouth. Is the horse's mouth really tight? In the, the really uh, tense, is the horse licking and chewing, is the horse in a calm, relaxed manner. Uh, same thing with the eyes, I'm always watching the horse's eyes, and we're going to go over all this here in just a few minutes on the lunch line. But are the horse's eyes nice, calm, and relaxed? Are they wide open? Is she really tensed up? Uh, we also want to watch the horse's ears. Uh, for example, you know, if I approach a horse, a horse and their ears go back like this, well, what's that telling me? The horse is saying very, very, very something nasty to me. Very, very nasty to me. All right, that's what the horse is saying. Uh, on the other hand, the horse's ears are just like they are right now. She's kind of listening to me. She's in a very relaxed manner. If they're all the way forward like this, you know, she's looking at something off in the distance or she's noticing something off in the distance and she's kind of looking around, uh, being very perky. It could be another horse or it could be something that she's alerting to that may be danger, not danger. So all these things can mean a lot of different things. And when I'm lunging horses, we're going to be looking at those things. We're also looking throughout the horse's body uh, to see if on the lunge line if the horse is going around. And one of the things I'm going, I'm going to look at the body if the horse is getting stiff in the body, in the neck, the shoulders, the rib cage, and in the hips. Is the horse stiff or is she going along in a good manner? Is she look like she's bending on the circle of the lunge line I have her on? Or is she like stiff like a two by four? And I'm also going to watch the horse's tail as we lunge her around. Is the tail going to sway back and forth from left to right in a nice, calm, relaxed manner? Is it really stiff? You know, what's going on with our horses? When we start doing this, we're actually peeling back the layers to what's going on with the horse and why the horse has that behavior issue. So, like I said, actions speak louder than words. And since horses can't so, uh, talk to us in English, then we got to understand their language, and their language is the actions that they uh, show us. So we're going to get uh, Bella here going on a lunch line right now, and we're going to go into more detail when I'm peeling back the layers and listening to the horse. So let me get this off here. So Bella, I've been with Bella for you know, a couple years, and she's good and trained now. Um, when she first came here, she was from a feedlot. She was from a feedlot, uh, Kilpin, and uh, the people bought her for about 150 bucks. And um, she came here, then they called me, and when she came here, uh, she had a lot of really, really bad anxiety issues. I mean, you put her on a lunch line, she just wants to race around you. Um, she had a hard time relaxing. Um, and she'd race around you and have these anxiety attacks and almost hyperventilate. Uh, it, 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 her anxiety was so bad. So we had to go into immediately, okay, the root cause of her anxiety and the root cause of her oh, it was almost hyperventilating is how she was treated in the past. She was badly abused and abandoned, neglected, and the memories from that past were coming back to haunt her. And she thought, oh, no, 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 it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. I'm um, going to get beat, whatever, whatever the case may have been. It was going through her mind, and those were the old haunting muscle memories that were coming back to her. So we knew that was the root cause of the behavior issue was her muscle memory coming back to her and how she was treated on the racetrack and how the, you know, how the people treated her. And it took a while, but we were able to get her out of her anxiety, and she's doing really well today. One of the things we did do to get her out of her anxiety is we taught her how to relax by teaching her the calm down cue where if I just pick up on the line right here and have her drop her head a little bit, she'll relax and just going over this real quick. I've said this many times before. When horses are excited, nervous, scared, higher than a kite, really stressed out, 
their heads are always, always, always up here. All right, you don't see horses like this, like that down there with their heads down. And the further the head goes down, the more they relax. And we teach this to horses, even if the horse doesn't have any uh, behavior issues, we always teach it on the ground and we teach it under saddle. It's called the calm down cue. And it's an excellent cue to teach any horse, especially if you have them out on the trails or in a show ring, uh, anywhere, because I can instantly relax my horse if they get scared, nervous, startled. I could easily just drop their head and have them relax. All right, so let's go back and tune back the layers. So we're going to come out here a little bit. And like we we're just saying, we we'll go ahead and get her lunging. So before I have her start lunging, um, she needs to stand here for about 45 seconds before I have her start going. And she needs to be quiet standing here for about 45 seconds. And the reason being is I don't want her to start anticipating moving around me. I don't want her to antis anticipating starting to go off and starting to uh, want one in the lunge at a walk trot or canter. I want her to sit here and wait for me. And this will also help build patience in your horses. Um, you know, same thing when I go to get on a horse, mount, I get on, and then the horse needs to stand there for at least 45 seconds on a loose rein before I'll ask the horse to move off. And again, the reason being is I don't want the horse anticipating moving off as soon as I put a foot in the stirrup. All right, so now we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna start lunging her. So we'll get everything ready here. So when I start lunging them, the first thing I'm gonna start looking for is how they're moving around on the ground. I'm gonna start peeling back the layer. So I'll ask uh, Bella here to go out a little bit. There we go. Then I'm gonna start watching her movement as she's going around. So if we're watching her head, is she bobbing up? Is she bobbing down? Which would indicate pain in the front or in the hind. And again, if your horses are in pain, you're gonna to wanna to call a vet, chiropractor, and have the horses treated and so they're not in pain or they're not in discomfort. Good. And then I'm going to also start watching her mouth, her nose. Is she breathing normally? Is she tense? Is she not tense? Start watching that mouth. Is she very tense in the mouth? Watch her head positioning. Is her head really high? Is it not high? Is she tense in the neck, in the body, um, whatnot? We'll watch the tail, see the tail swaying back and forth. So all this is, could be indicators of behavior issues, and let's just say she was had a fucking issue. All right, so we're just gonna pretend for a moment she doesn't, but we're just pretending uh, Bella's new to me, a uh, new training horse, and she has a bucking issue. And if she has a bucking issue, then I'm gonna start finding the root cause of the bucking. So one of the first things I would look for is when I start lunging her like we're doing right now, could she sit there and wait for the 45 seconds um, and then uh, start going on the lunge line or is she gonna anticipate and try to run out and start bucking? I'm gonna look for those types of things. I'm gonna look to see if she's calm, relaxed. I'm gonna see, start looking to see if she's in pain, uh, any type of pain at all. Nope, nope. That, that was a little indication right there that I, I don't wanna do this, now she's getting a little Wanting a little excited, but I didn't ask her to trot. And if you remember right, you know, th these are all controlled exercises. Um, if she's just going to start going off and trotting, that wasn't the, or change direction, that wasn't the controlled exercise. So she got herself worked up about something. So I'm just going to keep bringing her back to the walk. And then I will go back into just doing the walk again. So that could be an indication of bucking, getting to the root cause of bucking. And she just all of a sudden got herself. Uh, excited there and wanted to start really moving off and um, that could be an indication of bucking. I'm also going to look about, you know, at her back, keep an eye on her uh, top line there, on her tail, see how she's moving, does she look like she's in pain, does she not look like she's in pain, and these are all things we have to go through when we're looking for the root cause of the behavior issues. Uh, when it comes to any type of behavior issue, and like I said, when we start going into behavior issues, um, solving the behavior issue is simple once you find the root cause of the problem. Uh, the behavior issue becomes very, very difficult to solve when we don't know what the problem is or when we don't know what the uh, root cause of the problem is. Yeah, so she's doing pretty good here. So now we're going to go ahead and go ahead and change her direction. We taught her to change direction on the line. And she wants to trot, so I just want her to walk. So I'm just going to put a little bit of pressure on the line here and have her come back to a walk. And we'll just keep doing this. 
So again, you know, her actions are uh, speaking louder than words would speak. And when she's, you know, has some energy, she really wants to go, but that's not the exercise. You know, it'd be the same thing as people in the round pen just letting their horses run around them, do whatever they want. And we see it all the time, and I see it all the time, you know, not only with knowledgeable horse people, uh, but with trainers also. And it just blows me away why they would put a horse in a round pen and let them just do, let the horse do whatever they want and, uh, you know, buck, race around, and then come to find out, and then they get on the horse and they get mad because the horse is displaying the same behavior they just let them do in the round pen, you know, with them in the round pen. And then they get mad and say, you know, I'm going to beat the blankety blank out of this horse and da 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 da. And it drives me absolutely nuts because they're the ones who just, or have been, taught the horse how to do those things in the round pen when the round pen was, is a classroom and everything in the round pen is a controlled exercise. All right, so back to Bella. So again, uh, what she was just doing right there, she's kind of blowing out. When they blow out like that, they're releasing uh, stress, they're releasing you know, energy, and then right there, that was another good indication. And she's starting to relax and come around uh, better. She's not trying to you know, go off into her trot or uh, just pay more attention to me. So again, I'm also gonna watch her ears while I'm doing this, uh, see if there's an ear on me, which there's an ear on me. Uh, in other words, she's wanting to pay attention to me and she's uh, going by what I'm asking her to do or what I've taught her to do. And I'm gonna watch her eyes, see if her eyes are nice, calm, relaxed, and go throughout the body. I'm gonna watch her hind in. I'm gonna see if her hind, like her right hind is gonna be stepping up underneath her. Nope, I want you back at a walk. So go back to walk. There you go. Good girl. Go walk. 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 Thank you. So I told her, I asked her plenty of times there to keep it out of, uh, to walk. And then I had to put a little bit more pressure on for her to actually go into walk. So going back into the, for example, the right hind, I'm going to see if that right hind is stepping all the way up underneath her. And same thing with the left hind. And I'm going to make sure that the left hind is stepping just like the right hind up underneath her. Uh, she's not short stepping underneath her with the left or the right hind. So I'm going to be looking for all these things. And at this point, I want to rule out any type of pain or discomfort in the horse. So we want to start, you know, so once I know she's comfortable and she's not in pain or discomfort, then I can go on to other things and figure out, you know, the root cause of the behavior issues, but this is where we want to start at uh, solving the behavior or finding the root cause of the behavior issues. There she's doing pretty good. So we're going to go ahead and change her direction again. Go ahead and change. Good. And now she's going to go back to the right here. Nope, I don't want you trotting. Thank you. Nope. No trot. Oh, now see what happens when you do that. Nope, I don't want you trotting. I know you want to go. Nope. No trotting. Nope. So she's just getting herself worked up here a little bit. It's fine, but I'm going to keep consistent on the things I want her to do. And Bella's had uh, anxiety issues like we talked about before in the past because of her past abuse. And she's not nearly, doesn't have nearly the anxiety she used to have. She's gotten 10 times better. Um, but there's still those little triggers uh, that will, may get her in the little triggers we still have to work on uh, so she doesn't uh, get excited or start getting uh, anxious uh, with anything that we're going to do with her. Horses should never, ever, ever, ever in their lifetime be scared of anything I'm ever going to do to them or anything you're going to ever do to them. They should never be scared of anything we're going to do to them. All right, so we're going to have her keep walking here a little bit, and then we're going to go into some other things here. I want her to, she really wants to pick it up, and it, you know, Bella does live out at a pasture. So, you now if she wants to run around that pasture out there that she lives in, that's her playground. She can go out there, and she can uh, walk, trot, canter, she can buck, she can run, she can do whatever she wants in the playground, on the playground, and that turnout pasture is her playground. The only thing she can't do out there is she can't hurt herself, and she can't 
you know, wreck the fencing or anything. But beyond that, that's her time, that's her playground. Um, that's when horses get to have fun and go out and run around and do whatever they want is when they're on the playground. And here next week, we're going to uh, start a series on the playground versus the classroom. So what, what's, a, what's accepted in the classroom and what's accepted on in the playground uh, when it comes to horses. So this is pretty good. You know, she's uh, uh, walking around pretty good. So we talked about, you know, watching the nose, the breathing, uh, the mouth, watching the mouth. Is she licking chewing? Is she tense in the body? Then watching her eyes, see if they're nice, calm, relaxed. Same thing with the ears and throughout her body. Uh, to the tail, see if her tail is swaying back and forth, which it is. She's taking both hind legs and she's really walking up underneath herself. She's not bobbing her head up, she's not bobbing her head down, so all this looks really good. So now we're going to go ahead and stop her. And I'll, you know, she was a new horse to me. I'd bring her in, tell her she's doing good, and now we're going to the next step. So when, let me grab the lead rope over here. So, you know, again, when the horses come in, that, that'll be the first thing I, I do with them, is I will start lunging them a little bit. Uh, I'll usually have a halter on them, a lunge line on them. I normally will not turn them loose in a round pin to begin with, because um, there's a lot more I want to see that I could do with, uh, I could do with, uh, oh, there we go. Oh. There's a lot more I can do with them on a lunge line than if I just turn them loose in the round pin. And like I was saying earlier, you know, the round pin could be some of the best training you could ever do with your horses because you could teach them to go left, you could teach them to go to the right, inside turns, outside turns, stop, face you, face you wherever you go in the round pin. Uh, you could teach them to come, uh, to come when called, how to line up, how to heal. You could go into the beginning steps of leading. So the round pin is just a controlled exercise and why some of the best training you could do is because the horse is at liberty. You don't have anything attached to the horse. So the horse has to really start thinking about what it is that Mike wants me to do. And if I break it down into enough steps, the horse can learn it in a calm, relaxed manner every single time. That's the round pinning. But I like to start coming back layers when the horse is on the lunge line because if the horse did start to try to race off, uh, start to try to buck. I could always stop the horse by picking up on the line and stopping the horse's feet or changing the horse's direction and we go from there. But uh, So that's the first part I do is lunch a horse and I look for all those things. Then I'm going to see what the horse knows on the ground. So for example, I'm going to go ahead and see if uh, Bella will flex and I'll pick up on the rein here. And if she flexes nice and soft, then that's going to tell me again quite a bit about the horse in her neck on both sides so she has no problem giving into pressure and if she's giving here to the left and she's stretching the right part of her neck all right same thing uh, like i was saying about that person the other day on the horse she was riding her horse to the right so she was riding to the right she wanted the horse to bend on the right and stretch on the left side because if you know if i'm um, bending here to the right i'm stretching the left side of my body all right so I want to look for all those uh, type of thing, and then I'm going to also come over here, and I'm going to ask uh, Bella to, you know, flex to the right, and everything looks really good. That's also telling me a lot, a lot about the horse that she's you know, not not sore or tense or stiff on the sides of her neck. Another thing I'm going to want to do is I'm going to want to um, disengage that hip, and I want to see if she'll take that left hind and move it up underneath herself, all right? Now, some horses, when you disengage your hip, they'll want to step back here, which is an indication they don't want to use the lower part of their backs, or they'll, they'll uh, disengage your hips, but they'll go like this, and they'll bring them right back together, which means she doesn't want to stop, uh, step up underneath herself, and that could tell us you know, a lot about what's going on with her back. So when I, did, when I ask the horse to disengage her hips, I'm gonna go ahead and flex them, just like that, then I'm gonna put some I'm going to kiss him a little bit, and Bella's uh, starting to step up underneath herself right there. Good. Good. And so she is stepping up underneath herself, and I'm going to do the same thing to the right. I'm going to have her flex, and I'm going to have her step up underneath herself. Good. There she wants to get a little stiff on the line, on the lead line. So there we go. That was a nice stretch. 
Now, some horses are going to stretch a lot further up underneath themselves than others, um, just depending on how limber they are, but they should all be able to step up underneath themselves. So I'm going to start looking for those types of things also. Next, what I'll do is I'm going to go, I'm going to start playing around with the horse's head, see if the horse is all right with me, put one hand on her nose, one hand on her pole, will she drop her head for me? Um, can I touch her ears? Um, can I do these types of things? Can I, you know, pet her on the neck? Can I pet her throughout the body? If I'm doing these things, is she starting to get tensed up or is she, um, you know, stay nice, calm, and relax. So those things can tell you a lot too. And it's not always, you know, pain or fear or pain related or discomfort. You know, the horse could just be nervous about you touching certain parts of her body. Maybe she's just a jumpy horse and she's always jumpy and tense. And, you know, that would be coming down. That would tell me if the horse got pain, they're always jumping tense, that they just need a lot more desensitizing. So now I know what to go into. You know, if I put my head, my hand up here and the horse throws her head, that's telling me, you know, the horse, my horse is head shy or ear shy. And then if it's not a pain-related issue, then I need to go into exercises to start solving the pain, the, the I mean, not the pain. I need to start going into uh, exercises to solve the head shy or ear shyness, all right? Some horses, you know, people put twitches on their ears and the horse becomes ear shy or, you know, the horse has just had a bad experience in the past. And, some, and sometimes with head and ear shot horses, it is not even um, abuse. There was a quarter horse I had years ago, and I guess he was out past or whatever the case may have been, but he ran into a tree and split his head open, and the vet had to come out and stitch his head up, and that was fine. And then um, the vet had to come out and take the stitches out. After that, the horse didn't want you putting your hands anywhere near his head, and it was just a memory of... Uh, the, the vet stitching them up and taking the stitches out. It did hurt, but it was through abuse. It was you know, through taking care of the horse, and we had to get the horse out of being um, head and ear shy. Again, um, another thing we want to check for is I always want to put my hands here on the horse's mouth, uh, put them under, see if I can't put a hand in her mouth, see if she opens her mouth up, if she's nice, calm, relaxed. You know, sometimes when horses haven't had their teeth done in quite a while, if I put my hands here or here, it'll start tossing their head because the sharp points are poking in the cheeks now, and it hurts. Um, so, you know, everything we do with them, we're peeling back the layers, and we're listening to her and what she has to say to me. Just like when we were just lunging her out there a few uh, moments ago, and she started getting a little excited. She's sitting there talking, saying, hey, I'm getting excited. I want to try it. I want to get going. And I'm saying, no, you need to stay out of the walk because, again, I'm the teacher, she's the student, and I'm teaching the lesson. And if I just let her do whatever she wants, then she's going to learn the lesson was I get to do what I want. And when we go to get on her back, um, and she's going to do the same exact thing. I get to do what I want, and that's not the lesson I want to teach her. You know, there's other trainers out there that believe in, you know, letting the horses buck it out. Well, I don't because that's the lesson I never want my horses to learn is how to buck it out. You know, and I heard one trainer on uh, Facebook not too long ago, and he said, well, you know, I started this horse, and she hasn't bucked yet, so I got to get her bucking so I could solve the problem. And I was like, I don't get that. Why? You know, the whole thing about starting on broke horses is to never get them bucking because it's one lesson you don't want them to learn. So, you know, I guess just different people, but, you know, some of their ideas don't make sense at all, and what they do doesn't make sense because... We don't we want horses to learn the things we want them to know. We don't want them to learn things we don't want them to do. Again, bucking, rearing, bulking, um, those types of things. So now we're going to go to um, the saddle and bridling, and we're going to go over looking for some type of uh, pain-related uh, issues there. And we're also going to keep peeling back the layers, looking for, uh, you know, if she was a bucking horse or had other behavior issues. Um, finding the root cause of those behavior issues. And sometimes, you know, it could be just be, you know, we don't know about the horse's past, and uh, the horse could just be having really bad uh, memories from the past of being abused. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and take the blanket from you. Great. Okay, Bella, so let me go ahead and turn her this way. Good. So some things, you know, uh, we're going to go to blanketing, 
I'm going to put the blanket on like I've been doing it all, all my life with her. Um, or like the horse has been doing it all her life. And she would start moving around and she would tense up. That would be the horse talking to us and that would be us peeling back layers. So when we, we start running into peeling back layers, we start finding these little things that the horses are doing. Those are things you want to make the mental note of. You know, and if there happens to start being a lot of them, then don't, you know, have a friend or have a pad of paper out here or a friend that can write down, you know, these sort of things that my horse is doing. And then you, that's when you're peeling back the layers and that's when you're going to start finding the root cause of the problem. So, again, you just want to make mental notes of all this. So, again, um, putting the blanket on, you know, keep eye on her, see if she tenses up, does she want to move around, is she fidgety, is she like she is now, nice, calm, and relaxed. All right, now we're going to go to the saddle. All right. So going to the saddle, um, when I put the saddle on, once I put the saddle on, it doesn't matter if it's an unbroke horse for the first time or what the case may be. I'm not going to sit here and try to inch the saddle up. Um, if I try to inch the saddle up, then I'm going to give the horse all the time in the world to want to move around or to shy away or whatnot. So when I go to put the saddle on any horse, I just put it on like the horses had it on all their life. And I'll just put it up and over. And again, I'm going to be looking for things here also. I'm going to see if the horse was getting tensed up at all. I'm going to see if she was nice, calm, and relaxed. Um, you know, you're looking for all these types of things. If the horse is accepting it, not accepting it, um, that's all peeling back the layers. Now we're going to go around to the other side and let down the cinch. There we go. And now when it comes to cinching her up, bring this part up here. Okay, so we do have horses that are very, 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 very cinchy. When we go to cinch them up, you know, they want to pin their ears and want to come back and bite. And that could be a few different reasons. One of the reasons could be uh, they just don't want to be cinched up and they say, hey, I don't like that. They don't like the pressure or whatnot. Could also indicate some type of discomfort or pain in the back, in the shoulders. Um, down here on the girth area, it could be uh, showing the, you know, pain and discomfort down there. Or the horse just doesn't like being cinched up. Um, so th that's also the horse talk to us, and when we start working with horses, um, we start going through this process again. You know, I'm always want to keep my eye on their, you know, their nose, the mouth, the eyes, the ears, and see what they're saying to me. And then I'm going to proceed forward, so I'm going to go ahead and loop this around. And when I cinch the horse up, I'm going to cinch her up, not, not real tight, not tight at all but just snug enough to where if something did go wrong, the saddle's not going to come off, but tight enough, or loose enough to where I wouldn't get on. So it's tight enough to where the saddle's not going to come off, but loose enough to where I wouldn't get on. All right, and I always do the latigo knots. I don't ever use the buckles. Um, sometimes you're riding out on the trails, and the buckle, uh, you know, the horse, the, the, the saddle becomes loose because uh, the horse let out some, and... Um, then the, this buckle can pop out if you just use the buckle. If you use the latigo knot, uh, like like I always do, then um, it can you know this latigo knot's never going to come undone, and I don't have to worry about it getting too loose or or anything like that. So when I go to cinch her up, she stayed nice, calm, and relaxed there. That was really good. She didn't pin her ears at me. Uh, you know, looking at her nose, her mouth, her head, positioning. Um, her head elevation, her eyes, her ears, she's very, very acceptable of it, didn't have any problems. So when I'm, uh, any horse that has any type of behavior issue, when I go through all this, I'm always looking for these signs. Because looking for these signs, again, is peeling back the layers. All right, it's finding that root cause of the problem. And, and once I know what the root cause of the problem is, the, the, the behavior issue becomes very, very simple to fix. It's when you don't know what the be why the horse is behaving the way they're behaving, it becomes very difficult to fix. And again, you're taking that shot in the dark. Um, you're playing a guessing game uh, to why. You'll, you'll probably never solve the behavior issue if you can't find the root cause of the problem. All right, so next we're going to go to bridling. 
good girl. You're being a good girl today. All right. So the bits I use, I always use uh, snaffle bits uh, like this one. This is a full cheek snaffle. I'm a big fan of full cheek snaffles. And come here, Bella. And one of the reasons I'm a big fan of uh, full cheek snaffles is because of the bars on the side right here. And I do work up with a lot of behavior issues in horses, a lot of horses that, you know, have, have issues going on. And I know that, the, that if I have to hurry up and pick up a left rein or a right rein, that this bar is not going to slide through the horse's mouth. I don't have to worry about it. Uh, I don't have to worry about having the chin strap on it. And I know this bar is not going to slide through her mouth if I have to hurry up and do an emergency stop or uh, whatever the case may be. All right. So that's why I'm a big fan, and I'm also a big fan because it is a snaffle. Um, we always want to, you know, ride our horses in, you know, the most comfortable uh, bits and the, the, the gentlest bits that we can have. And this is a pretty gentle bit. You know, it's a full cheek snaffle, and, you know, everything can be very, very gentle on your horse, except for a few items, but everything can be very, very gentle. It, if it, it really comes down to your hands and how your hands are on a horse. I, I could, you know, somebody could really hurt a horse in the snaffle as they can a, uh, a big old shank bit, all right? So uh, it comes down to your hands, but again, I like the snaffles. Um, they're, they're very, very, very gentle bits. They're very, very easy to use, and uh, it's very, very, very easy on the horses. Okay, so now when it comes to bridling, Rebella. So when it comes to bridling, I'm also going to be looking for things when I start bringing the uh, head stall towards the horse. I'm going to do there. She ducked her head down a little bit for me because she's been taught how to do that. But for example, if a horse is to move their head away from me, that would be telling me something that the horse doesn't really want to fit in their mouth. Why doesn't the horse want to fit in her mouth? Or if she was to start throwing her head up in the air or you know, trying to take off from me because I have the bit in my hand. So that's going to... Uh, be horses, you know, talking to you, and that's going to be also peeling back the layers. So I'm going to put my hand here. I'm going to put another hand here on the top of her head. I'm going to bring her head a little bit towards me and down, and then I'm going to feed this up. Don't nibble on that, please. Thank you. Then I'm going to put my thumb in her mouth, and I'm going to slide the bit in, and then it's this ear and that ear. So th that was about perfect. She accepted it in a calm, relaxed manner. Um, but if there was signs of her wanting to move her head away from me or throw her head up in the air, then uh, that would be uh, other things I would keep in mind that she was doing those things. That would be getting to the root cause of the behavior issue. Um, when it comes to her throat latch, I like to be able to put my hand in, you know, through the throat latch that, that is plenty snug. You don't want them tight like this because if you ask your horse to collect, it's just going to come get tighter and it's going to choke them. Or if I at least put a hand through, then then it's going to be all right for me to ride her and bring her into the bit because it won't be choking her. All right, we're going to go ahead and take the lead line off her. And then we're going to go into this a little bit more. Good girl. So when before I start getting on any horse um, you know, that comes into training with me, I'm also going to see how soft they're on the bit. So I'm going to go ahead and turn uh, Bella this way. Good boy, good girl, Bella. Oh, no. Oh. Go ahead and back up. I don't want her walking off on me. Good. So I'm also going to see how soft they are. So if I pick up on the rain, and Bella's pretty soft there. And again, I've worked with Bella for a while now. And I'll make sure that they're soft and on both sides. If they're stiff or if they're not giving to the pressure or flexing, that could tell us a lot of things. Either they don't know the exercise and never had to do the exercise before, or nobody ever went through all the steps it took to teach the horse how to flex with the halter or uh, the bit on. You know, it could be telling us a lot of things. Or maybe the horse's you know, neck is in pain on this side, the side they have to really stretch on. It could be telling me that the, you know, maybe their teeth hurt or something's going on. So we got to figure that part out. And again, you know, if I knew that, um, for example, nobody ever took the time to teach Bella how to uh, flex to the bit, then the, the solving that issue is pretty simple because all I have to do is go through the steps and teaching her how to uh, give to the bit. So we'll be looking for those types of things also, along with, you know, now the, the, the saddle is on, 
I'm also gonna look to see if she can disengage her hips. So have her flex and disengage her hip right there, good, right there, good, right there. So I'll do that from both sides and see if she can disengage her hips uh, pretty good. And she does. And because if she didn't with the blanket saddle on, then that could be telling me something is up with the, the saddle being cinched up on her back and that's affecting her rear end a little bit. She was doing it fine on the ground, but when the saddle goes on, then uh, she doesn't do it good. So now I'm gonna make sure my saddle is tight, which it's not. So now I'm gonna, I'm gonna go ahead and snug my saddle up enough to where it's snug enough to where I'd get on now. Yes, and again, I use a lot of go knot. All right, so when I'm mounting and dismounting, Again, we're peeling back the layers, looking uh, for the root cause, finding the root cause of the behavior issue. It could be any behavior issue. I'm also going to uh, start putting my foot in the stirrup. Um, I won't start off by using a mounting block. If I use a mounting block, then I'm up on something. And if she was, if I was to go to get on her saddle and she started moving off or something, and I had to step down, I could, you know, step step down wrong on the mounting block and step off and go underneath the horse or you know, it's just a bad deal altogether uh, when there's behavior issues. I'm all for getting on horses with mounting blocks with horses that are trained to do so with a mounting block. Um, <clears throat> but when they have behavior issues, it's always safer for you to get on from the ground. All right, so I'm going to put the stirrup a little bit towards me. I'm going to hop halfway around. I'm going to see how she looks from right here. So I'm going to have her flex towards me just a little bit, just in case. Uh, she decided to do something that could always move her hips away from me, take my foot out of the stirrup and have her move away from me. So I'm going to be looking at her ears, her eyes, uh, everything from right here. She looked pretty good. I'll kind of hop a little bit. She still looks good. Then I'm going to go halfway up to the saddle. If she looks good after that, I'll go ahead and flip a leg over her. <laughs> and we'd want to do that from both sides of the horse. All right, and we're always looking for those signs that she's talking to us through her actions. And then once I get on, I'm going to go ahead and sit here. I'm going to be on loose rein. And again, I want all my horses to stand here once I get on, on loose rein for at least 45 seconds before I ask them to move off, move off or I ask them to start doing something. I want them just to stand here uh, for me for about 45 seconds. All right, so moving on to pulling back the layers. Uh, this, this, this is the first process I go through uh, from the time we started this video until now. So another thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and pick up a rein on her saddle. I'm going to see if she's going to be nice and soft here. And she's, you know, very nice and soft. Then I'm going to pick up the right rein and have her flex to the right. Again, yeah, she's very soft there. Um, she, you know, being up here, she doesn't look very, she doesn't look tense, stressed, she looks pretty calm, her ears are actually uh, focused on me, they're not pinned back, but they're focused on me, so she's kind of listening to me, waiting for the next cue to, uh, for me to ask her to do something, so we were always looking for those uh, types of things, I'll uh, pick up a rein now, so I'm going to slide my left foot a little bit back a little bit, kiss her, have her disengage that hip, right there that looks pretty nice so i'm gonna take a look at that uh, left hip as i was doing it and now i'll take a uh have her get to the right i'll bring my right leg back a little bit to disengage her hip and i will watch that right hind see if it steps underneath herself good right there yes and see how she does with that and she looks pretty good with all of that and of course the next steps i would go in is depending on what the behavior issue is is whether i'd start walking her forward or i'd uh, just teach her the flexing and disengaging the hip so if she was a um, bucking horse and we already said and, uh, you know, decided uh, she was not in pain she was not in discomfort uh, then I would definitely sit up here and keep flexing her and disengaging those hips. And that would be her first, probably second lesson, maybe even her third lesson, depending, depending on how she did. And then after we got done uh, really getting her butter soft, 
on the bit and disengaging those, hip, those hips. And I, you know, of course, go into working with her shoulders, getting her shoulders to step off to the left and to the right, and then start moving her forward a little bit and uh, go from there and find, figuring out what the root cause of the behavior issue is. You know, when it comes to horses, when it comes to bucking, they can be bucking for a lot of different reasons. Um, maybe they had a really bad start, maybe they're in pain, maybe it's a fear-related issue, etc. It could be a lot of different things, and it's always up to us to find out what that root cause of the behavior issue is when it comes to our horses. Alright, so this is going to be part one. Uh, next week we'll go more into uh, peeling back the layers and finding the root cause of the behavior issues while under saddle at a walk uh, trot a little bit out of canner. We'll go ahead and cover that next week. So we hope you enjoyed this video. Uh, be sure to also check out my members page. Just go to Google, type in Mike Hughes Horsemanship members page, click on the link, and subscribe. When you do subscribe, there's also a three-day free trial. And on my membership page, there's over 280 videos, full videos, with step-by-step -step easy to follow methods in solving behavior issues, starting up a broke horse, working with rescue horses, building the confidence and trust in rescue horses, yeah, solving yeah. Um, stall vices such as cribbing, weaving, stall walking, and then we started our new series, Your Hands on the Reins, which you'll actually see us out on the trails, solving, you know, buddy sour problems, barn sour problems, spooky horses, uh, tailgating, now which I mean by tailgating is uh, your horse is behind, but he's always on the horse in front of him, he's always on that horse's butt, so we want to start creating distance between that horses, and we just have so much to offer on there, and when you do become a member, you can also join my uh, group page on Facebook where you can post videos if you're working with your horse, you can ask questions, post pictures, and that way I could help you and your horse more because I could actually see what's going on. So we hope to see you as a uh, member. It's only $13.50 a month and you can cancel any time. So we hope you're enjoying. So to everybody, Happy New Year. Hope you're enjoying your new year and welcome 2021. Thank you. Have a great day and enjoy your horses.